Um, I hope you guys had an awesome holiday, great Christmas and New Year's. I hope that it was uh, just notated with like lots of different times around tables with loved ones, friends, and family. I hope some of you guys got to have like a homemade brisket or ham and no turkey because that's for Thanksgiving uh, or anything like that. But I heard it was like a great time with the people that matter the most to you, that mean the most to you. Um, But I can imagine that uh, from time to time when we get together with our families and then our extended families that we don't see all that often, everything's going great, everything tastes amazing, people are telling great stories, everybody's laughing, and then all of a sudden from one end of the table, uh, you hear somebody say something that takes all the oxygen out of the room, something along the lines of, Oh, did you see he was indicted again? Who would ever vote for him? Who has half a brain and who would ever vote for him? Or maybe you have a family or a meal where someone's like sharing a clip on their phone of, can you believe this guy? He can't even put two sentences together. See, he fell down again. Isn't that hilarious? Check out the sound effect when he falls. How funny is that? Oh, who could ever vote for this guy? They would have to be a complete idiot. And then you just like find yourself leaving the table and going to the restroom just to take a breather for 10 minutes. So you don't have to think about it. Am I the only only one who does that? But here we go again. We are eight days out from the very first votes being cast of the 2024 uh, presidential election in the Iowa caucuses. Uh, This is all happening. And uh, I believe that it's really, really important for us to talk about it. But it feels like uh, we are just, you know, four years removed from uh, the 2020 election. And anybody else still felt that you have PTSD from that time, right? I feel like, oh my gosh, like it just sort of sends shivers down my spine. I mean, our country going through such a uh, ridiculously um, season of upheaval and of, of anger and violence. I mean, there was the riots that happened in the racial unrest because of the murder of George Floyd. There was this little thing called COVID that affected all of us. And then you had a presidential election where the gloves were off and things got really, really nasty. I mean, the vitriol and hatred that was spewed from people on both sides about the other side was something that took me aback. I mean, I remember thinking like, I didn't used to know what who everybody voted for, but now I know that they hate me <laughs> because of who they vote for and how they think about things. And it was just so sad. Uh, this online misinformation that was barraged from both sides about the other side to where it was hard to understand what was true and what was being manipulated. And of course, as humans, we always tell the worst case scenario of these stories, and so we all believe things that we're embarrassed about believing now. There were a couple presidential debates in 2020 that devolved quickly into like food fights in a middle school cafeteria where they were like yelling over each other and nobody knew what was actually going on, and we were all left thinking, is this the best we can do, really? I learned a couple weeks ago that in the 2020 election, in America, there was $14 billion spent by both sides to get their candidate to win. $14 billion, which is a lot of money, but it's even more so when you consider that in the 2016 election, $7 billion was spent. And at the time of 2016, that was the most ever. So we are doubling the amount of money that's flowing in from our two main political parties trying to get their person Elected. I mean, it's just embarrassing when you think of all the good that could actually be done with those resources, right? So we all have some PTSD from what we experienced four years ago. But let me tell you, as a pastor, what the most disheartening thing about what we all experienced in 2020 was. To me, the most disheartening thing, the thing that I am still messed up about, was not just how it all went, but it was church people, It was Christians, it was me, it was the people that pledge our ultimate allegiance to King Jesus and the way that we jumped into the mudslinging, the way that we jumped into the political fray and anger that was displayed publicly. I mean, the anger, the fear, the militaristic approach, the like existential crisis that we were all feeling about if this side wins, then what's going to happen? And the ends justifying the means in our behavior, in our language, in our emotions and attitude that we shared with other people, including myself at times. And frankly, like I'm embarrassed about it. 
I feel some shame about the way that followers of Jesus, church people, how we just jumped into the mudslinging and we jumped in to the fight in 2020. So we're planning our preaching calendar for 2024. And I started thinking like, we've got to talk about this because Politics shape us and the way that we engage the political system shapes us and it shapes our witness and our credibility in the world. So we have to talk about it. And we have to talk about it for this reason too, because as followers of Jesus, um, I, I don't want to just bring my emotions to Jesus. I wanna bring my head, I wanna bring my hands, I wanna bring my heart, my entire being to Jesus and surrender every part of me to the, uh, what theologians call the Lordship of Christ, for him being the boss. And that includes how we engage publicly, that includes how we engage politically. So I feel like we have to talk about it. And I feel this like pressure and this like divine sense of calling not to just do this series in September and October, right in the heat of everything. When after we've all said things we regret, after we all know how Deborah down the hall, like how she votes and how she thinks, we need to talk about it now. So that by the end of 2024, after all the votes are cast and there's either going to be an incumbent president or a new president or a president for the second time around, whatever it might look like, I want us to be a group of people that are proud of the story that we tell this year. And we look back at what we said and how we treated people and how we engaged in the process and we look more like Jesus than we look like our preference for cable news. That's why we're talking about it at the beginning of the year. Also, we're eight days away from the Iowa caucuses, so it's about to get real messy and really terrible really quick. So I thought we'd jump in right here. So, I, but I want to, because I can just tell there's some pensive feelings in the room and you're like, what's he gonna say? Am I gonna have to storm out? Is this my last Sunday? All those kind of things, I get that. Um, I get that, because I would be thinking the exact same things, but I want us to start here. Here are three ground rules that we're gonna run with in this series, and I wanna make this commitment to you, this promise to you that we're having a different kind of conversation about faith and politics. First ground rule here, Bridgeway is and will always be a politically diverse church. This is not a right-wing church. This is not a left-wing church, Republican, Democrat church. This is an everybody church. You right now are sitting down the row from people that voted against who you voted for in 2020, who voted against your interests. You're sitting with them right now. And nobody ran for the door, right? And we're always gonna be this way. This is not gonna be a church that's just comfortable for one side of the aisle as much as people will try to pressure me or try to force me or pigeonhole me into this. Man, I just don't think Jesus plays that game. The way of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, it provokes both sides of the political aisle. It speaks a whole different language, a whole different game. And we're gonna to continue to be a church for everyone because we're gonna keep our mission the most important thing, not who people poke their ballots for, okay? So that's the first thing I wanna let you know, that this is a politically diverse church and we're going to stay that way. Second, we believe that there is no official, official Christian political party. <laughs> There's no way that you can vote that this is the Christian wave that everybody needs to vote. I love what Pastor Tony Evans says, that Jesus didn't come to take political sides. Jesus came to take over. Jesus is not running for office. Jesus is a king. And the way of Jesus provokes and challenges and includes people who see the world differently in the way that they order the world politically. That you and I, we can all have a law Law of Christ, meaning that we're called to love God and love others, in law of Christ informed mind and come to different conclusions of who we vote for. So we believe that there is no official way that you're supposed to vote. And if not, you're being disobedient to God. Um, just to be honest with you, like I have seen the way that the opposite of this has played out where there have been people pressure people to vote certain ways and use spiritual language and spiritual authority to make people do it. But I believe this, that when Christians get in bed with politics, everybody loses because politicians will use and abuse and manipulate people and their faith. So we're not gonna play that game at all. There's no official Christian party. Third ground rule I want to leave with us is this. The Bridgeway Church will not be endorsing a presidential candidate in 2024. Actually, I like our tax exempt status as a church and nonprofit, so I'm not gonna mess with that at all. And my role here is not to encourage you 
who to vote for or how to vote. So we're not going to play that game at all. And I believe that we would have a really interesting, if everybody over their heads right now, we could see red or blue or something in between. It'd be really interesting, but it would be diverse. And we're not going to play that game of telling you who to vote for, how to vote, who you should endorse. Because again, I, we don't believe that Jesus plays in those games in that way. But what I am really interested in doing, what I'm called and compelled to do for our faith community is to challenge us to engage with the political process with our faith in mind this year. I want us to engage with this process in a new way, in a Christ-like way that tells a better story than what we saw in 2020, what we saw in 2016, or what we feel like we had to do in years previous. I think we can tell a different story. And first, we got to talk about the way, the common ways that Christ followers, church people um, do politics first. Because I think there are some some negative attributes to both of these common paths that people take. One is to just simply disengage from the political system. To be like, well, like Christians, we should just keep our minds set on heavenly things. Take that verse of Philippians out of context and be like, just set your mind on things above and don't think about things down on earth. You know, like it's just all about getting to heaven. We don't have to think about the way that things play out on earth. Politicians make laws and policies, but Christians, we're called to just pray. And hear me in this. Like I, I believe in prayer and I don't care who knows it. Notice the politician thumb. <laughs> but I think this whole disengaging from po- the political process, not caring, not engaging in the way our society is ordered, it actually can do a lot of damage. It actually says that um, we don't care about people the way that God cares about people. Because here's the reality, and I think we could all agree on this, no matter what side of the aisle we tend to fall on, but politics actually do matter because politicians make laws and policies that affect your life. And what I'll argue in the series, more importantly than your life, the life of your neighbors that you're called to love and witness to. These things affect them. And we all agree on this because we all want our kids to be safe, right? Can we all agree we want our kids to be safe? We all don't want taxes to be so high that they prohibit growth or opportunity in our community, right? None of us want that. And we all want clean drinking water. Can we agree on that? Like, can we have a political agreement about something? We all want these things and laws and policies inform these things and change what these things look like. So for those of us in the room that are like, I just don't like politics. I don't want to engage in it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to like even know what's going on. Like these things actually matter because they affect people that God loves. And so these things do matter. So I don't think it's actually helpful for us to completely disengage. But the response to not um, engaging often has gone to a very dangerous place. What I like to call just fighting through politics, to where there is an enemy and we need to defeat the enemy and I don't care what I say, how I treat them, how I do things because they need to be defeated and the ends justify the means and so we'll do whatever it takes to win. And in this fighting through politics pathway, um, I think a lot of times we equate and we, can, we um, mess with a couple of terms that don't mean the same thing. A lot of times we conflate politics and partisanship. So for example, this is a definition of what politics actually mean. Politics is the process by which a society orders and distributes power through governance. It's a process by which society gets ordered and power is distributed and there's governance and this is leading us not towards chaos, but order and this is a good thing. People jockey for how power in society is ordered and distributed through what I think can be something that is very dangerous. It's the other word, not politics, but partisanship. And here's a definition of what partisanship means. It's a strong dedication or loyalty to a political party, usually accompanied by a negative view of the opposing party, right? Partisanship says, I am a this, I am a that, and I hate the other side. I'm opposed to the other side. I want to fight tooth and nail against the other side. And in partisanship, my friends, this is where the battle lines are drawn. This is where there are enemies that need to be defeated. And there's an existential crisis of if they win, then the good guys are going to lose. And of course, I'm the good guys. And of course, God's on the good guy's side, my side, and he's against the other side. And we must win. It doesn't matter how we treat people, how we talk about people, how we actually work in this process. So 
This is the fight through politics that I need to defeat this group of people come you know what or high water. I think both sides actually, these paths that I think Christians and religious people have walked and engaging with the process, man, I, I, I think it leaves a lot to be desired and it leaves a lot of people damaged in the process. So what I'm, engaged, what I'm encouraging us to do, what I feel compelled to talk about and have a conversation and invite us as a community into is not telling you how to vote, not telling you who to vote for, but encouraging you to engage in this process in what I like to think of as a beautiful and radical third way of Jesus. <laughs> because every four years, I don't know about you, but I hear that this is the most important decision that you'll make. Who you vote for is the most important decision you make. But I am coming more and more to believe and realize that it's maybe that's not the most important decision, but how we treat people, how we engage in this process, what we think about power and our ultimate allegiances. And if we're going to use power that looks like Jesus, or if we're going to use power that looks like Rome and Caesar, and if you're here at Christmas, like Augustus or Herod. That's the conversation that I'm interested in having. So um, we're calling the series Decisions 2024 because we're putting us beyond that decision of who you're gonna vote for. I'm not here to convince you how to do that. But the, there's four decisions we're gonna break down in the series that I think are very vital for us, looking like Jesus and following Jesus and partnering with God in this year that I want us to commit to. And the first decision, I'll just not mince any words. That's where we're going today. I will not be a jerk to others about the 2020 for election. You guys catch my drift. I will not be a jerk. Hear me. If you hear nothing else, we don't need any more jerks for Jesus. <laughs> Moving the ball down the field. It's not the way that God works. It's not what he calls us to be. I want to encourage us to not be jerks to others or the others, whatever the other side is during this 2024 election. It's, it's a fascinating thing because people fighting over power and how the, our society is ordered. This is not a new thing that started in the 2016 election. This is actually something that goes back thousands of years to the time that Jesus walked the earth as well. People have had political opinions, thoughts, worldviews that they thought were the best. Um, actually, you see this in the group of 12 disciples that Jesus actually walked the earth with and then lay, handed the keys to the church too. Uh, we see this in Matthew 10. We see this list, this description of Jesus' disciples. These are the names of the 12 apostles or disciples. First, Simon, who is called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were known as the sons of thunder, so you know they were really passive. Um, and we see Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. I love the little give him the description of what he did because it was a negative connotation there. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who, little sidebar, betrayed him. A little, little stab there for Judas because uh, he was not well liked by the disciples. Anyway, what we see inside of this list, the closer we look through a historical lens, is we see people that had different worldviews, different ways that they saw power and how they followed God in regards to a political system around them. We see Peter, James, and John were told they were from the Galilee, which was a very conservative part of Israel that had what was very much a Pharisaical or a Pharisee worldview. And the Pharisaical worldview said, oh, we just need to, whatever the Bible says, we need to follow it word for word, make sure we just keep faithful to the text and we don't do anything wrong. We just got to make sure that we're right there to the letter of the law and everything. And that's how God's kingdom will come. And that's how we're supposed to live. We see that next to Matthew, who's a tax collector, who had given up his right as a son of Israel and basically betrayed all of God's people by joining up with Rome and stealing and extorting God's people for their money. I mean, tax collectors were the worst of the worst people, traitors who had just bent their knee to Rome and did whatever Rome wanted them to do, and they got rich while they were doing it. We see Andrew and Philip in this list of disciples. And Andrew and Philip, it's fascinating to me, we learn in the Gospels that they were actually first followers of John the Baptist before they became a follower of Jesus. And John the Baptist, most biblical scholars believe, was a part of a group called the Essenes. And Essenes were separate, separatists from culture. They lived out in the middle of the desert in this place called Qumran and other communities because they didn't want to come close to what culture was doing or the religious elites were doing. They wanted to be far 
away. So that way their faith wasn't diluted and they stayed away from those icky people that dealt with power differently. And that's where Andrew and Philip came from. And then we see Judas, uh, we see Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot. Simon the Zealot, he's even given this in his name. He was a zealot. And what was a zealot? It was basically a religious terrorist who believed that it was their role to come in and use violence to overthrow Rome or anybody that was corrupt. This is who Jesus invites into his crew. And also you see Judas Iscariot, which many scholars believe Judas was actually from a zealot uh, family as well, because his last name is Iscariot. Scario was the type of dagger that zealots used to sneak up on people and, you know, mafia style, take them out. Um, This is the crew that Jesus brought together as his disciples. People that had lots of different worldviews on how they engaged with power, with government, with politics, and with their faith. (laughs) Like it or not, Jesus hung out with a motley crew of very different people. And you know what I love about Jesus? Is I think he did it on purpose. At one point in the gospels, we're told that Jesus pairs them up two by two, sent them out to proclaim the message of the kingdom of God coming to earth and to heal people of their illnesses and diseases. And I just imagine, this isn't in the Bible, but I just imagine that Jesus paired them up like Peter, a Pharisee worldview next to a zealot or Matthew, the tax collector, people that would have never hung out together. They were actually on mission together. You have a zealot and you have someone who's at a scene who's not supposed to go into the world at all and have their life and faith diluted. They were hanging out together. Can you imagine the arguments, the prejudice, the judgment, all the meal times, the awkward silence, the travel times to the next community and how different they were and how they viewed ordering of power and how to use governance and how it all lined up for them. I mean, Jesus set these people up that were very different. And I think he did it on purpose to teach them something first, then ultimately to reveal something to us. That if you have your mission as the main thing, you can have unity without having uniformity. I think this is something we have to learn. That if you are clear on your mission and you are mission critical on what matters most, that you can have unity around that even if you don't have uniformity and if you guys see things differently. We've got to learn to keep our eyes on the mission, not to get distracted keep our eyes on the mission. It's fascinating to me because, you know, Jesus, he was hanging out with his disciples. He was exemplifying what the kingdom of God looks like, healing and teaching and changing the world. But then Jesus goes to the cross and he dies. This sacrificial death for our reconciliation and redemption. And then three days later, Easter, we celebrate, he rose from the dead, launching this new creation of hope and light and life. And then for 40 days, he's hanging out with his disciples. He's popping in all these places, doing some more teaching, showing them that they can trust him, that he is the king of the universe. And then right before he ascends to the right hand of God, the father, he gives his last marching orders, like the last words of Jesus. And the last words matter, right? They matter to us. They carry some weight. And Jesus reminds them in his last words, the mission that his disciples, and ultimately, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, what we're called to carry forward as well. And we call it the great commission, but these are Jesus' last words. He says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now don't miss this. This is not a partisan statement, but this is a political statement from Jesus saying, if you wanna know what power looks like, who's got all the power, who's really the boss, who's really the one in charge, it's a me. I have it all. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says this, therefore... He's about to make a statement here. Therefore, what's he going to say about his power? What's he going to say about the way that his followers are supposed to engage with his power? If our leader is Lord, then we need to take over, kick some butt, take some names, uh, defeat all of our political enemies, make sure that Rome really goes down hard to teach a lesson to all our enemies. We need to get focus groups together and do some negative ads because then we can convince them not to go with the other side or vote for the other side. Or we need to get together and talk about how right we are on our separate little text messages and about that person we work with that we disagree with politically, who is such an idiot. We need to do that. Therefore, that... That's not what it says. Jesus says, I'm the boss, I'm the Lord. All authority on heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore do this. He says, go, go and make disciples. (laughs) Go and make learners, make people following me in my way. (laughs) 
And I don't miss what he says about where. He says, of all nations. The connotation here is that go and make disciples learners of people that are different than you and different from me and to see the world differently than you and I do. Go out to them, be winsome, include them in to what I am doing in the world because all authority and all power on heaven and on earth, it belongs to me. And this is how you're gonna do it. He says this next, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, giving them their new name as a beloved forgiven son or daughter in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The method that Jesus gives his first followers and the method he gives us today, our mission critical vision and mission was to welcome others in that are different than us. Welcome them in, show them the rope, show them the grace of Jesus and how it satisfies the deepest parts of their life and soul and gives them purpose. Welcome them in, show them grace, show them the ropes. He says, then teach them everything that I commanded you to. If we follow the thread here, what are some of the last things that Jesus commanded his disciples? What was still probably burning in the memory of his disciples as Jesus gave his last words? Some of it could be John chapter 15, some of the last commands of Jesus in the gospel of John. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Love, not as just a feeling of warm butterflies, but of an action. Love them the way that I loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus says, go to people that are different, that see the world differently than you do. Make learners, make disciples, teaching them everything that I've taught you. And this is the stuff that I taught you last, right? Love people the way that I loved you. Teach them to do what I commanded you. Let me ask you a question. Is it even possible to love people the way that Jesus loved us if we berate them? Is it even possible to love people the way that Jesus loved us if we belittle them or demonize them or public, publicly make fun of them? Do we make disciples of Jesus that way or do we make disciples of our own pride and self-righteousness and our own political enlightenment that we're the ones that understand it? We can have unity, even though we don't have uniformity, when we keep the mission of making disciples, of loving people and showing them the way of Jesus, not by belittling them, demonizing them, making fun of them or the candidate that they support, you guys. Fast forward a little bit farther and these followers of Jesus, they're, they're actually taking Jesus' word seriously. It's a beautiful thing when followers of Jesus do that. And they start this movement. They're telling everybody about Jesus. They're inviting people to trust Jesus as their Lord and as their savior. And, and this crazy thing starts happening because at this point, the f- first followers of Jesus were all ethnically Jewish. And they believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. But this crazy thing starts happening because people that aren't Jewish ethnically start coming to faith in Jesus. They start trusting Jesus. They have an undeniable experience with the Holy Spirit of God. And they're like, I wanna follow Jesus. And then the Jewish leaders of this early church are like, well, you got to become Jewish first, right? Like, because, you know, you know, Jesus was Jewish, you become Jewish, and then you follow Jesus. That's what they're thinking. And there's this huge argument at this council in Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in Acts 15. Um, because they're arguing like, well, these new Gentiles are the people that aren't Jews. They want to come and be Jesus followers, but... Um, you know, to, they have to become Jewish first, right? And what's tricky about this is mi- Jewish or men that wanted to become Jewish, um, children of the first covenant, they had to have a very private procedure, a very sensitive operation. And so the thought was, <laughs> you guys aren't picking up what I'm putting down. I'm not going to go clearer than that. Uh, <laughs> The thought was that if you wanted to follow Jesus, you got to become a Jew and you've got to have this procedure first and then you can follow Jesus. And so they're arguing about this. And you can imagine that the new believers class was pretty vacant, especially if you're a 30, 40, 50 year old man who's converting to Jesus. They're like, I don't know about that. But Jesus' half-brother James stood up in the meeting and he said some words that, man, they guide my ministry I try to let them guide my ministry. They sit in frames on all of our staff's desk here. It's a principle that I want us to hold forward 
for our lives as we walk towards this election season as well. James says, no, they don't need to become Jewish first. Come on, guys. He says this, Acts 15, verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are, ret- are turning to God. You guys, why are you making it harder than it needs to be? We shouldn't make it difficult. We should make it as easy and clear as possible for the Gentiles to return to God. They don't need to snip, snip. They don't need to do that at all. Let me ask you this question, just off this principle. Is it possible that the way that we engage politics, the way that we talk about the other side, it makes it more difficult for people to come to Jesus, turn to Jesus, to find a faith community like a church? Is it possible that the way we talk about the other side and we berate the other side and belittle the other side leads people to think, well, I just know that I won't belong there. They're all soulless Republicans there. They have no heart. Or they're all woke, brainless liberals there. Uh, There's no way I'm going there. Did I offend everybody equally? Is it possible that the way that we talk, the way that we engage, the way that we let our emotions get the best of us in the mudslinging makes it more difficult for people that we have profound disagreements with? But if we remember our mission, we've got to love people, be winsome to people, include people, welcome people to experience Jesus first and foremost. Enough of diagnosing the problem. Let's, let's let the rubber hit the road here. How do we move away from being such a jerk this year? How do we get to the third Tuesday in November and be proud of the story that we lived? Be proud of the way that we look more like Jesus this year and not just what CNN or Fox News has told us to look like. What are some steps we can take? First is this. I want to challenge us all to be a community that does this, to treat everyone like an icon Icon, not that little thing on your phone representing the app. Icon, not just Beyonce. (laughs) An icon, a sacred image with the thumbprint of the divine on them. We've got to be people that view and treat everyone as sacred, as valuable, as got the imprint of the divine on them. This is every person that we come in contact with, especially people that we disagree with where there's a challenge. They are people to be honored because they are connected to our God. And this is a unique Judeo-Christian idea. But every single person has this image of God in their life. In the ancient world, around the time that the Bible was being compiled, there was lots of talk about people in power. They're made in the image of God. Ooh, they look like God. They're in the likeness of the divine. But then the story of Genesis comes into play and tells a profoundly more inclusive story of all people for all time. And it says this, verses 26 and 27. God said, let us make mankind, everybody in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is everybody. You guys, you have never made eye contact with another human being who wasn't an icon, a sacred image of their creator. You have never talked to another person, been in traffic next to them in another car, a person that didn't matter desperately to the heart of the father so much that God sent his own son to die for them and to rise again for them. That includes whoever the nominee for the Republican Party is this year. That includes whoever the nominee is for the Democratic Party or Libertarian Party or Green Party or whatever flavor you like. Everyone is an icon. And we've got to be people that start seeing and treating people like that because the you that's actually in front of you is always more important than your political view. It's always more important, not because I say so, but because the creator and the sustainer and savior of the world says so. And hear me, I don't want to mince words on this and this is going to sound harsh, but I really actually believe this to be true. That if everyone is made in the image of God, when we offend them, when we belittle them, when we dehumanize them and tie them to a view that we disagree with, when we dishonor them, it's not just us being rude, it's blasphemy because they matter to God and they are made in the image of God. It's actually not cursing them, it's ultimately cursing God as we make fun of them and belittle them. 
because the you that's actually in front of you is always more important than your political view, and they are more than their political view that you disagree with. So practically, you and I will have so many social media traps this year that I want to guard us against. You're going to have the trap, I'm going to have the trap of sharing a news article about the side that we don't prefer that's a gotcha piece. Ooh, they said this. Ooh, hot mic, they said this. We're going to feel like we want to share that so it feels like we are winning. You guys, the, the memes... The jokes that are going to be online this year, making fun of a candidate or making fun of people that vote for a candidate, they're going to be plentiful. (laughs) And you're going to look at it and be like, (laughs) you're going to chuckle and you're going to want to hit that share button. But as you hit that share button, you are offending and belittling and dehumanizing probably 50% of the country, roughly, that we're called to love and serve and invite into the story of Jesus. And this has to do with the candidates too. Whoever the candidates are, Check this out. Here's some like hot take for you. Whoever the candidates are, they're actually human beings too. They're not a caricature. They're actually human beings with spouses and families and hopes and fears and feelings. So when we make fun of a side of the aisle, we're offending half the country. We're belittling another person. You're making fun of the people who vote for them and disparage them. You guys don't do that. When we post online, when we share, when we even hit the like button on these things, I want you to know that these are the emojis that I want to send you when I see this stuff. (laughs) I want you to remember this. I'm not going to actually do it. It's too shaming, but I want you to remember this. This is what I'm thinking. And maybe perhaps this is what Jesus is thinking when he sees our posts that do these things. Just disappointed. Maybe he's not mad. You know, it's worse, right? Isn't it worse? I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. It's not the game that we're called to play because we should, call, we should view and treat everyone as an icon because we're more than our political view. We're more than the, what we might, how we might vote and what we believe on an issue. View and treat everyone like an icon. And we might want to stop there because, you know, like I'm good with keeping the peace and I'll just separate from them. I won't talk to them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I won't make fun of them, Joel. I won't do that because I don't want you to think about it. We want to stop at like keeping the peace, but you know, an annoying thing about Jesus, just one of the things that I find annoying about Jesus is that he's, he's never stops at just keeping the peace. He says in my kingdom, people will be peacemakers moving towards the other. And that's what you and I are called to do. I came across this organization that started in 2020. Um, It's a nice play on the words here, but it's called this. Make America dinner again. See what they did there? It's an organization, a uh, nonpartisan organization that actually gets people together around tables to share a meal. People that just profoundly have disagreements on hot button political issues, but they're like, can we listen to each other? Can we talk? Can we start the conversation less of you're a bigot or you're an idiot and more with pass the mashed potatoes? These groups happen all over the country where people actually sit down and do what the graphic says. They seek to understand and then perhaps to be understood. Beyond just keeping the peace, you guys, man, what would it look like for us to be a countercultural group of Jesus followers who don't just keep the peace, but we're called to make the peace? And here's the other challenge I want to give us inside of this. Go back to the slide right before this that I just skipped. I wanna challenge you to love your enemies until you make them friends. And you might be like, oh, Joel, but they're the enemies. They're the ones that are destroying the country. You don't know, we gotta stop them. We've gotta hate them and do whatever it takes to fight them and then to win. Hear me, you guys, and we all have political opinions. I'm not void of them either. But, and you can separate from people that you disagree with. You can hate people. You can fight people. You can demonize people all you want, but you can't do that and follow Jesus at the same time. You got a choice to make. And we're called to love our enemies, to move towards them. And what I love about the make, dinner, make America Dinner Again reality is that it has listening at the core of it. I love what author David Augsburger says about listening. Isn't this true? Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Being heard is so close to being loved that for most people, it's indistinguishable. Listening, growing in empathy, that's what changes the game. 
So may we be a community of people that do the hard work of not just keeping the peace and keeping our mouth shut, but by moving towards people and listening to why they believe what they believe, understanding, seeking to understand, not just to win the argument, to pray for these people and for God's good in their life. And I don't mean like country song prayers of a prayer that their dog dies, a truck breaks down, like not those kind of prayers, but praying for God's goodness and blessing to flood their life, even if you see the world differently than they do to serve them actively, to find ways to lighten their load, to be present in their lives, to spend time with them, in the same room with them, not with your arms like this. Because isn't that how Jesus loved us? All the way back to that love others the way that I've loved you. Didn't he come to us and lower himself in human form? Didn't he listen to us and serve us and spend time with us? Dare I say that like when we move towards our political enemies and we intend to make them friends, man, we look like Jesus. We partner with God. Maybe that's what it could all be about. So back to the decision for today that I'm encouraging you, I'm challenging you, I'm inviting you, I'm calling you to make is this. I will not be a jerk to others about the 2024 election. Is it possible that we could tell a better story this time around? Is it possible that Christ followers can live in a countercultural way where people go, what? They care, but they don't care with a sword. They don't care with a smartphone. They care and they love and they serve everyone. We're not a void of political opinions. I'm not asking you to be a void of that. But what I'm asking you to do in light of Jesus is to not let your political opinions get in the way of you loving people and meeting them where they are. I tried this out in the first um, service and it was kind of fun. And actually I think it was meaningful for me at least as well. Um, I'd love to ask you guys to stand up. I, I actually, I wrote a bit of a, a pledge on the theme that we're going through. And I, uh, I'm gonna read it to us and then we're gonna go back and if you feel led to do this as a way of you following Jesus, you can repeat after me, but I'm just gonna read it in one run and then we'll go back and read it together. But here's the pledge. I will not be a jerk to others about the 2024 election. This year, during the presidential election cycle, I will treat everyone as divine icons. I will seek to honor the other side in my heart, through my words, and through my actions. I will seek to understand, not just to win. And by God's grace, I will not be a jerk. Can we, some of us, can we say this together? Can we pledge this together? And just in the spirit of the theme, hand over the heart. I'll just do it a couple words at a time. And I'm being cutesy, but I really mean this. And I really feel compelled that we're called to be a community that lives this out. So if you believe this, if you want to be marked by this, let's say this together. This year, this year. during the presidential election cycle, during the presidential election I will treat everyone as icons. I will seek to honor the other side. Once more with feeling, I will seek to honor the other side in my heart, through my words, and through my actions. I will seek to understand, not just to win. And by God's grace, I will not be a jerk. <laughs>